uh, I think I think the time. Let me check about time. Yeah, uh, I think yeah yeah. Uh, let's get started. I think more people will join or watch the YouTube video later on. So today is our great pleasure to have Dr. Yang Jianfeng from uh, University of Padova uh, speaking with us about his work. So Jianfeng did uh, spend his early days in China um, and uh, also worked with uh, Zhao Liang and uh, uh, Zhu Xiang at the Chinese Academy of Sciences at the Institute of Geology and Geophysics. And currently he's a postdoc at uh, Padova University in Italy. So today he's going to talk about his work, um, um, some of his work in recent years on the topic of volatiles in subduction zone magnetism inside from numeric modeling. So with that, I will give the rest time to Jane Fong. Okay, thank you, thank you for the invitation. Uh, today my talk, uh, before I, I plan to, uh, to talk about two works, but uh, because one of these work has not been published yet. So today I will only maybe talk about the all published um, paper. So first I'll give a simple introduction. Uh, from this uh, sketch, we know that uh, along this subduction, the water can be transported from the surface to the, to the mantle due to the breakdown of uh, hydrous uh, minerals, for example, amphibole, loss lozenite, chloride, and this water will go back to the mantle and, and cause partial melting. These partial, melting, partial molten rocks will be, uh, be extracted to the surface and so, such that the water will, will finish a, a cycle in the subduction dome. Uh, from a big sketch, uh, the cold slab can go from the surface to the transition zone or even the low mantle and all some some part of the water could could be uh, trans also transported to the transition zone and the low mantle, and with the mantle convection, the upwards flow could also transport the material, probably include the water to the surface. So this is another big cycle of this uh, water. Uh, then, how much water in the mantle? We know that in the upper, upper mantle, the most abundant minerals are olivine. Olivine has very low uh, water solubility. It's around 100 ppm in the shallow depths, but it will increase around the depths to so, uh, probably 2,000 ppm in the upmost uh, upper mantle. Uh, in the upper mantle. And uh, uh, if we go to the transition zone, it's mostly uh, composed by the wazelite and the leodite. These two minerals has a uh, large capacity of water, which is around one to three percent. And if you go to the low mantle, which is around uh, composed by the ferrocrys and the bridgmanite. A uh, bridgmanite is the dominant phase, which is around eighty percent, but it has also low uh, water solubility. It varies from maybe a um, few tons of ppm to uh, less than 1,000 ppm. But actually, uh, we don't know how much water exactly in the mantle, but there's some samples from the deep mantle that we know the mantle probably are uh, water rich, at least locally. For example, the uh, hydrous limelight from Razor, they, it contains about 1% or 1.4% of water. And also uh, this phase egg mostly in the sediments or kitchen crust. Uh, due to the development of this uh, high, high pressure, high uh, temperature experiments, many dense hydrous magnesium silicates are assembled in the lab. Those, uh, those uh, DHMS phases, they are, they are uh, for example, phase, phase D, uh, superhydrous phase B, phase H, and also many uh, aluminous phases. They have large uh, water capacity, and which could be uh, stable at various pressure temperature, but most of them could only stable in, inside the slab. 
uh, recently, there's another paper that they found this aluminum rich phase D could be stable to 26 gigapascal. This aluminum uh, rich phase D is mostly rich in the occasional crust because uh, the basalt could mostly uh, completely dehydrated at, at around 300 kilometers. If this aluminum rich phase D could uh, con could contain the water in the low mantle again. That means that uh, when it transports to the low mantle, the, when the slab dehydrates, it will go to the uh, crust again. Then this crust is likely to contain the water to, to much deeper depths. Uh, then we have a, a simple summary that uh, this, uh, these hydrous phases are the most, most important minerals to contain the water to the to the uh, deep mantle. I mean deep mantle mostly the low mantle depths. Uh, because uh, uh, there's another part as I mentioned, another part uh, work that we haven't published. So I will not introduce, uh, introduce it here, maybe next time. And this work is mostly um, working on this how water can be transported to the low mental depths. And today I will only talk about this, uh, the interpret and participate organism. And uh, the, the study region is in the East, uh, East China. And from the tomography data, we, we know that the Pacific plate is currently stagnant in the transition zone. And this is the classic paper by Huang and Zhao. And we we have several uh, important observations here. The first one is the Cenozoic volcanism, especially this uh, Changbaishan volcanism. Changbaishan volcanism is active. Was uh, there was there was some uh, recorded eruption in uh, 1960 or, or quite recently, but this volcanism is really far away from the change which is around one, more than 1,000 kilometers, which means it is uh, an interpret organism. Most studies think that the interpret organism is probably related to the Pacific plate subduction. And the first, uh, the first mechanism uh, proposed by Tang from the seismic tomography data, they found from both P and S wave tomography, they saw uh, the low velocity zones. Uh, it tends from the from seven hundred kilometers to around one hundred kilometers. So they proposed the the slab is probably uh, broken. It has been tiered. So there's there's a return flow uh, feeding this uh, Changbai volcano. Uh, however, uh, from the local local and the teleseismic tomography and also joint immersion by uh, Da Feng Zhou's group, they found that the slab is uh, quite continuous in the transition zone. And then, and then they proposed a big mental wedge uh, model, which means the slab transport to the transition zone depths and it dehydrates in the transition zone. And this water will goes to the upper mantle and cause partial melting to feed in this interpreted organism. The second observation is uh, the prominent low velocity zones above this uh, slab and also below and behind the slab. But it's really, we should be really careful about the low velocity zones in the tom tomography uh, images because it's likely some artificial. But a very nice work by Obayasi, uh, they carefully checked that the, some uh, ray paces uh, go through this, uh, the low velocity, velocity zones behind the slab and they found that the low velocity zone could reach uh, minus 1.5% 1, 1 and they are real, they are not artificial. The artificial means sometimes if you have uh, a low velocity zone, it is also likely because of the seismic anisotropy. For example, the low, low, uh, the ray pace goes through this uh, slow velocity, 
a direction that it could cause this uh, low velocity zone, but here it's not. They are real uh, low seismic velocity. And the third observation is this uh, petty spot volcano. The petty spot volcano was first found by Hinano in 2006. And the, this, uh, around this uh, change and also about 600 kilometers away from the change. Um, and they also uh, simulate from the chemistry, they simulate that the, these petty spots are quite water, water rich. They have been rich in uh, uh, the carbon and the H2O. And the first observation is the high, high uh, electric conductivity in the eastern China. In the transition zone depths, they found the, the high electric conductivity could uh, result in about 0.5 to 1 weight percent of water. And, and if we put all these observations together, we know there are some isolated mechanisms to explain one of these uh, observations. But there's, there'll be, there'll, there's no integrated explanation. From the electric conductivity, we know that the transi transition zone depth is probably uh, water-rich. So if these uh, water-rich zones uh, in, interact with the with the Pacific plate, this water could uh, could be squeezed out out of the transition zone, and due to the high water capacity capacity difference, it will cause partial melting. This partial melting could likely to expand these low velocity zones. So we made a simple setup. We we use uh, uh, this slab slab tip and a wet transition zone at, at the initial step. Here, the bunch condition is periodic on the size and free slip because we use, also use this uh, sticky air approach. So it, it could mimic this free surface bunch condition. Uh, we don't impose any other uh, forces here. So the, uh, this model is fully dynamic. First, I show you a, a movie of the subduction process. First, uh, when the uh, slab subducts, it was uh, it will uh, squeeze the water out of the transition zone to to the upper mantle and cause partial melting. And later, this uh, uh, slab will also squeeze the water to the low mantle and also behind the slab. This uh, this partial melting could reach could result in the mud extraction process. So here the yellow is the, is the extracted mud. And at the later stage, uh, when, the, when the slab retreat, there'll be much more water squeezed out behind the slab and it caused part, a mud extraction behind the slab. So uh, if, if we look at this, uh, fee, this final stage, here I show the composition, water content, and, and our synthetic velocity uh, anomaly. We can see three uh, molten zones. First is behind the slab and below the slab, and above the, above the slab, above the full ten uh, in front of the slab. Now these uh, three molten zones can, can result in the low velocity zones which could be comparable with the uh, seismic images. And be behind the slab, we can see the extracted mud, which could cause it, uh, result in this uh, organism and also in front of the, of the slab, which is more than 1,000 kilometers away from the church. This, uh, this uh, organic uh, could correspond to the uh, interpret organism in front of the slab and also behind the slab. So if we look at the, uh, the evolution of the volcanism, here the x is the distance in our model, and the y is the model time. The black, line, the black curve is this uh, change location. Here's the change, we can see the change is retreating. And the first is the aqua 
aqua canals, and then the intraplate or canals, and then the petty spot or canal. We can see the aqua canal is somehow parallel to the to the change, while the intraplate or canal is uh, always far far away from uh, the change, and the, and the pet spot has a very similar uh, trend. And we did some, uh, except from this uh, reference model, we did some other experiments. Here, first, we investigate the extraction time scale. Here, the extraction time scale is, um, is to describe how, how easily the mud could be extracted. If the time scale is, is larger, it means it's more easier to be extracted. For example, if it is, is relative small, in our reference, we use 6,000 year for the mass extraction. If we lower the mass extraction time, then there'll be, be more uh, partial molten rocks above the 410, which means it'd be thicker. And if the mass extraction time is smaller, then there, there's only really thin uh, layer of molten rocks above the 410. If the water content in the transition zone is lower, then we could also see a much less mud extraction and also less amount of mud, uh, partial molten rocks. And there's no petty spot could be formed behind the slab. And due to some uh, experiments, the mud, uh, mud density is also important for, for this process because uh, previous a study always saw that the mud density could be at least uh, neutrally buoyant at the full time. But we, we noticed that if the, if the mud uh, contains some water, it could be more buoyant. So only if it is more buoyant, the mud could be extracted. Otherwise, the, uh, the compaction process cannot, cannot occur. And here we also use another different mud density from uh, grit and set of uh, uh, by these uh, uh, experiments. And they, they had a, a bit lower mud density and we still found the mud extraction could occur. Because we use a uh, very uh, homogeneous water content in the transition zone, here then we only impose some uh, wet inclusions, which means okay, the, the water is not homogeneous. There are only some, maybe only some uh, wet pockets in the transition zone. We, we didn't see a very nice subduction and retreating slab, but we do see some uh, the partial molting above, above the photon and behind the 660 still occur and also partial mud, uh, mud extraction could also occur. And uh, except, uh, except from this uh, East, Asia, uh, East Asia, there there's some other uh, low velocity zones above 410 in Tenchung or Kenan, for example, also uh, below 660 in the Western America are also observed in, in seismic images. Also in Europe, in, U, uh, in Europe, uh, the low velocity zone above 410 and around uh, 800 kilometers uh, below this uh, transition zone, they're also uh, reflected in the receiver functions. And also globally, the, the, uh, the low, velocity, low velocity zones above 410 seems a global feature. They could vary from 20 to 100 kilometers thick. So here, uh, today, this is my talk. I hope I can convince you that this hydrous mental transition zone can comprehensively explain these uh, four important observations in East Asia. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and uh, by the way, we, uh, this paper was published in this early year, and I also write a, a Chinese uh, explanation in uh, in our institute. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.
for your presentation. Now it's time for questions. I think we do have a little questions for you. Yeah, go ahead uh, for the participants. Maybe Mimi could. What were some other? Oh uh, yeah, any participants feel free to open your mic or type your question in the chatting place. Hi, I wanted to ask about some petrological evidence. I mean, is there any uh, exploration of rocks that can uh, confirm this modeling? Uh, what what petrological evidence do you mean? Uh, well, for example, isotopic evidence or just uh, mm, just uh, the observation of rocks uh, uh, that, for example, uh, can be xenoliths uh, that are uh, that are um, provided on the surface. Uh, yeah, actually, there are, there's a Nature Geoscience paper maybe in around 2015 from Japanese group, they found this uh, basalt, which is uh, rich in water uh, in Changbai Volcano. This is the first evidence. And this, uh, they also found this uh, M1 rich rocks, and could, which means this uh, has to, been, to be isolated for, uh, I don't remember, more probably one billion year. So they, are, they should be um, all the time reached. So this is the, from the petrological evidence. Thank you very much. So could, uh, yeah, uh, for, for our participants, could you also let, uh, introduce yourself, drop your name and your institution? So Natasha, could you introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Natasha Selutina. I'm from Lomonosov Moscow State University. Okay. okay, great. Okay, next question. Okay, I'm going to read the question for Ming Ming. So Ming Ming typed the question. He says that uh, is the melt at 410 kilometer denser than the ambient mantle? If so, how does it, it, it erupt? If not, how does it accumulate above? For 10 kilometer. So basically that, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Ming Ming is assistant professor from Arizona State University. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know Ming Ming. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a very important question that as I mentioned, um, I remember the authors, but the group from, also from Japan, they have studied the published the paper in 2006 in Nature. Also, also another paper in 2005 in Nature. And they measured the density of this of the malt in the transition zone depths. And they used this uh, stink and the flow method, yeah, which is, um, also it's not that accurate, but, but it's a very important work. They found this malt, uh, the malt could be, could be uh, neutrally buoyant at this, at the full time. If this mud is more denser than the surrounding uh, mantle, then it's not possible to be extracted. I mean, there's no possible for the mud to, to migrate. So we, we go further, we have a better look at their experiments and we see that if the mud is dry, then it is likely to be denser than the surrounding mantle. But from the experiment, they also show that if if the mud could contain about two to eight percent of water, then it's likely to be buoyant than the surrounding mantle. Then we we also know that uh, for for normal thermal gradient in the mantle, it's impossible to cause a partial melting for the dry rocks. Only if you have some, uh, for example, water or carbon, and in some uh, water tiles reached mantle it is likely to cause partial melting. So here we use uh, here for the reference model for example in the transition transition zone we initially assume 0.38% of water and this water could mostly go into this uh, 
partial molten rocks, the partition coefficient is always around, uh, it's not exactly, there are some difference among the experiments, but it is, it is always around 0 .0 0.1. Uh, so there's enough water, which is could, could reach 10% of uh, water in the malt. So this malt is somehow uh, buoyant compared to the surrounding mantle. And we also uh, test, I mean, here, here this experiment is from, from the, uh, the physical experiments, but here there's some uh, simulations of the mild density by uh, Guillot uh, and the Seto. And they also show that the mild is, could be more buoyant than the surrounding mantle. And uh, another work by, also there's another work by Jin and the Kretel, uh, probably in 2009, they also showed when, when water exists in the mud, then it be more buoyant than the surrounding mantle. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's all, all the evidence to prove that the mud would be more buoyant if, if, if it contains water. Yeah. Uh, but, 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 but also in this question, Mimi asked that how does it accumulate at 410? If it is buoyant, then how could it accumulate? How could the melt accumulate at 410? Um, uh, first, thing, you have to know that the, the water content is relatively low, and the mud fraction is also very low at these depths. Here, the, the mud fraction is only around 1 to 2 percent, but, but for this low amount of mud fraction, it is still uh, possible to percolate because uh, maybe the, I think there are only two experiments at the moment, as far as I know. One is from uh, Yoshino in 2007 in the EPSL paper, and another one is 2017 by French group uh, in 2017 in Nature Communications. They show that the, uh, the dehesion angle is quite low at these, uh, these depths. So if the dehesion angle is no, that means the mud could be well connected. So even though you have very low mud fraction, it is still possible to percolate for the mud. Uh, oh, 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 okay, I have a following question for this. Actually, it's uh, what Mimi and I, we discussed in the previous journal reading that, uh, like I say, even by this relatively low, or like I say, uh, buoyant uh, hydro smell, that uh, how could it reach the surface by several thousands of years, I think, in your model. I think it's like, I forgot the exact number, maybe 12,000 uh, 12, uh, 12, years or something like that, then it reached the surface. Then that means it's eruptions, uh, that's migration extremely, extremely fast. So, so how could you, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so what's your explanation for that? Okay, um, first, uh, the model in, in the, uh, in our paper, in this, uh, these figures, there are only one phase flow, they are not two phase flow, because this is a, a really complicated process. We have um, subduction, because it's also fully dynamic. We have subduction, we have water migration, we have this uh, partial molten from the shell depths to the low mantle depths, and we have this mud extraction. So here the model is, is complicated enough. And we are, at, at this stage, we are, are not pay, possible. And uh, I think there's nobody is possible to uh, simulate the two-phase flow at this scale. So we, we did another experiment, which is to uh, realistic two-phase flow. We use uh, we low density here at, at the transition zone depth at 410, actually. And we simulate how this how, it, how this amount could percolate to the surface. So this, this is how we explain uh, the mud could go through the ocean sphere and to, uh, go through to the lithosphere and to the surface. First, uh, due to the percolation of the, of the mud, it could uh, form the dip, uh, diaparison. Then it is uh, goes through the channeling and one go to the viscoelastic uh, region, mostly is elast uh, elastoplastic region. It will progress as the diking. 
so this is uh, uh, the process to explain how the moth could uh, migrate through the through through this upper mantle to the surface because the upper mantle is is mostly viscous and they they will only uh, percolate in the diaparison and the channeling when it, when it comes to the lithosphere because lithosphere is quite strong it is only possible to percolate in the um, in the in the uh, in the ducts also if if we want to simulate the two-phase flow, it requires very high resolution. Yeah, the res I don't remember the resolution, but it is very high resolution. The the mass migration has very different time scale with the uh, our mental connection model because here it could be a few hundred years or even few years. It is so it is impossible to uh, simulate these two processes together. So we use this uh, one phase flow and but we, we illustrate uh, with the two phase flow to say that our, our uh, assumption of the mass extraction is efficient. Yeah, this is a simplified process. Okay, oh, okay. I, I have still following question for this uh, before I read Mimi's question as well as Arkayoti's question. Is that does that also mean, as I say, uh, I, I don't know that how to view this. So. If the melt extraction is not so fast, is your model still valid? For example, if you change the melt extraction rate to maybe one million years or as, as something like that, that is a several, several orders magnitude slower than the rate that is shown in your model. So will, will you still get similar uh, results or not? Uh, here we have this model, for example, we we can go to another extreme condition that there's no mud extraction, right? So the mud cannot be extracted. This is not go to extreme, but it's uh, most likely. So if there's no mud extraction, then the slab goes and it causes partial melting and in the upper mantle, this, this mud which is mostly influenced by the slab it goes through and here there's still the mud because the mud fraction is very low. We have to remember that the mud fraction is quite low. So it will not, it, it basically not influence these dynamics because the dynamics is mostly dominated by the slabs reduction. Uh, do you think, do I answer your question? Okay, okay. Uh, okay, uh, let, let's move forward. We have a lot of other questions from the audience. So this is a, a read a question for Arka um, uh, that Arka from uh, Indian Institute of Technology and is asking that does the rollover of the subduction plate plate bear any effect on the dehydration? Um, that's actually that's a, um, another good question because here. Um, our slab is quite quite cold, and you don't see the dehydration process in the slab. If uh, if the slab if the slab could stay stays longer, for example, it is possible to heat up the slab, and dehydration occurs inside the slab. And this is then this is the model as proposed by Da Peng Zhou. This uh, um, but this. Still, this process cannot explain the um, the working is uh, the results observed in Tang Bai Volcano because it's not recent. It is it has this water has to be isolated for uh, almost one billion year in the transition zone. It's not uh, caused by the Pacific Plate. Okay, so I'm um, so going to read uh, the question from Mimi Lee, uh, Arizona State University. So here's still follow up the question. So if the melt goes so go to the surface so quickly, so how does it accumulate about four ten kilometer? So why there is no melting between the surface and the four ten kilometer? So do you also include the phase transition and latent heat in your models? And 
and uh, he means phase transition latent heating at the 410 uh, between uh, at 410 and 6060 kilometer. Maybe we can read the chatting place, the chat box. Uh, I want to find if uh, uh, here I didn't show it, but we do have a phase transition. We have phase trans. Uh, the phase diagram is uh, generated from the perplex and both for the basalt the man or the mantle. So we do include all this uh, phase transition, for example, and uh, basalt from, from the short depth to ecologic phases or post garnet phases, and also for the mantle. We have all these uh, this phase transitions. Uh, first, and then go to your first um, question about the mud extraction. The mud extraction is a, a is a simple. I have to say, mud extraction is a simplified process. We uh, we assume that the mud uh, migrates very really fast, and it will it will not significantly change the deformation of surrounding uh, rocks. This is somehow valid, maybe in the in the shallow depths, but it, it might be uh, influenced by the mental flow in the oceanosphere, for example, because this uh, retreating is, is strong. And uh, we also show that the multi migrates is mostly with uh, the channel channeling it because the low uh, low density it goes it goes, uh, the velocity is much higher than the surrounding rocks. So it might deflect a bit, but not significantly. So it is still likely to, to go through this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, up mantle. But the problem is that if the mod can go through the lithosphere is a big problem. That's because uh, the lithosphere is strong. So it's, it's not easy to go through. So some of melt is likely to be trapped inside the lithosphere or, or maybe in the, uh, in the up, uh, lower crust, I mean, around the moho because the divergence is high. The moho has a high temperature and low viscosity and then you go to the lithosphere and lithosphere is very strong. So it gets with really, really large divergence around this zone. Dome. So melt could be accumulated there. And then this mod is also likely, this could be form a magma chamber, then I migrate at a later stage, but we don't simulate this process. We just, we just assume that uh, it, will, uh, it, it will have this uh, mad extraction process. It's a simplified process anyway. And uh, why, why doesn't it mod in the, in the surface? Is that, is that the question? Oh, he says that why there is no melting occurs between surface and the 410. That is in the upper mantle in your model. Oh. That you didn't consider any other melting that potentially could be going on. No, uh, here that's because the, uh, this blue, they are hydrated mantle. They have, they contain water, but here they are dry. So there's no, uh, no water here then it, uh, it doesn't reach the mountain condition, so there's, there's no mountain. Uh, actually, for this, I was also uh, a little bit confused. Maybe I didn't read as carefully as, uh, uh, because in, I think in some of the other plot, it shows that this, uh, like say figure A here, uh, in this blue zone, so that it contains a certain amount of water, I think it's already like water saturating in the outer man, upper mantle. Uh, is that true? Or, no, that, or is, it still, is it still undersaturated in hydrogen in the upper mantle olivine? No, they for, are for this blue, for, for, Yeah, for these blue zones. Yeah, uh, we see this is uh, here, we set uh, 0.3 weight percent. And this, the transition zone is possible to hold this amount of water. When it goes out of the transition zone, uh, because the uh, relative lower uh, solubility caused the uh, partial melting. And of course, it has to reach the, 
uh, solders. Automatic extraction, you will see that the mud goes, goes with the uh, mud. So the remaining rocks, the residual has less water. So you will see this here will be less than uh, 1,000 1, ppm. This, uh, for this 1,000 ppm is, as I said, uh, the olive has large uh, water capacity around the depths. So it will increase. If you go to the shallow depths, it is possible to melt, but not at these depths. So it, it is still undersaturated. Yeah, this, uh, this work you can, you could see from a uh, group from, uh, from a German, German group from uh, Bayreuth. Uh, actually, I, when I was thinking about that, I was thinking about that in your model that you tried to explain uh, the low velocity zone one, two, three. So which one that was lacking in your model that did not match with the uh, uh, West Pacific was the one of, of the low velocity zone immediately above the uh, subduct slab. Well, in your paper, I think you sort of wave your arms for that. Uh, so that actually, I was thinking that in this one, uh, maybe that could, like I said, with a certain amount of water that it could help with the melting to occur so that it could reach some low velocity zone that could help to explain your model. Uh, uh, but, but anyway, I will jump to another question that is relevant to uh, the previous discussion we had. So for example, you know, figures one to A, B, C, as at the bottom part of it is all 800, uh, 800 kilometers. And so there might be artifacts in the lower bound uh, because this is a closed box model. And so, so, so have you considered that expanding it all the way to maybe to like 2000 kilometers or something like that at the lower box? So that, um, uh, do, do, do you think that by expanding that will change your, uh, this low velocity zone below your transition zone slab, you know, this red part? in figure A, for example. Uh, they do you think that will still hold? If you enlarge your box from eight, bottom of your box from 800 kilometers all the way to maybe 2000, uh, or even all the way to Earth's common boundary, do you think that low velocity zone will still hold? Uh, okay, first I answer uh, your question about this, uh, if, the, if the water is able to expand these low velocity zones. No, it's, uh, it's not. First, if you see the paper by uh, Ma, Ma, I don't remember where, which university is. she is. Anyway, she went back to China and she has several papers and also from a group. That's uh, this amount of, uh, for example, 0.1% is, is not able to cause any seismic anomalies. And it's only at least uh, in my mind. I have to check the paper, but it is around one, at least one weight percent of water could result in uh, observable, observable uh, seismic anomalies. So this amount of water is not able to expand the low velocity zone. And then for this uh, low velocity below 660, uh, I, have, I had uh, some models with 1000 or even 1,500 kilometers, and we we still see the, that the the slab can um, can squeeze the water to the uh, low mantle. If the model is larger, if the model goes larger, it is possible that the the mud zone could go go to a bit deeper. It quite depends depends on the low mantle viscosity, of course. Yeah, but still, I think it's still valid. Because uh, the slab goes, slab is going to uh, stagnate above the 660, then the mud has to go go deeper. Yeah, and also because the slab here is the return flow like this, uh, return flow like this, and below the slab is return flow like this. So here is more easier to go go deeper because there's a down a down valley, a return flow uh, in this direction. Uh, I actually I'd like to argue with you for this, for the above 410, for this hydrous 
uh, in your model that is subsolidus. Yeah, I agree with you from Mojo's work from USDC China. Uh, her, let's say it is true that in subsolidus conditions, that a small amount of water, I would like to say even even by thousand ppm water doesn't affect too much about seismic velocity. I agree with that. Uh, uh, however, this amount of, uh, of water, even in subsolidus condition, can greatly enhance electrical conductivity. So if it is self-consistent with the, the story that you are trying to make, then I would expect that there are very high uh, electrical conductivity um, above the 410 in, in this blue zone that they're showing here uh, with no seismic uh, 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 anomaly. So there should be, like I say, the, the, uh, there should be a correlation uh, between these two. And if it had generated a large amount of melt, as the red zones you are showing here, in figure one, then that has both low velocity and a high uh, electrical conductivity. Uh, so that is in a subsolute condition. Uh, however, I am still a little bit doubt that uh, with a relatively high hydrogen content, that let's say when people compare, think about the melting, that they're always looking for uh, the average upper mantle uh, composition, for example, and um, yeah, it, it's not so the upper mantle is quite hydrogenous. So. Uh, that depends on which two end members composition you put on in the phase diagram, or even three end member composition. Then you look for your tactic, and then you look for the hydrogen content and how much it uh, depressed the melting temperature. So by that, I, I'm not really convinced that, that the, the, the melting will not occur. But I don't think you could address that in your model uh, under current situations. Uh, yeah, it's just some of the comments, but I think we should leave more time for other audience to ask questions. So do we have any uh, questions from the other, other audience? Yeah, hi, Dr. Yang. This is Shi Chaoji, uh, currently working with Dr. Zhang. I am curious about the sub, uh, 79th the mental from the in figure A right now, uh, because it was it is really widely spread from surface into the diaper, uh, into the deeper. So I'm really curious about mineral comp components. Do you have that data? Uh, the mineral, mineral evidence for what? Uh, mineral uh, assembles for the sometimes the mental. I, I mean the purple, the purple color in your figure A. So it's, uh, it's, it, it, distributed, it's, it, it distributes from the surface, actually it's from surface into the uh, transition zone. So uh, I mean, uh, they have the similar or even same mineral components or different? Uh, I think there's no direct samples from the transition zone. Yeah, there are very few uh, direct samples from that depth, but there's some uh, signature. For example, recently there, there are quite many papers from uh, the, chem uh, the chemical part. For example, uh, this uh, some early time, I think uh, the paper in EBS here, uh, Huang, uh, Huang, uh, I don't remember, but uh, also they also proposed uh, some uh, the chemical evidence that the, the the signature should be from the transition zone. Here we uh, we use the evidence is mostly by, as I said, by the Japanese group published in 2015 in Nature Geoscience, Science. And also the, some other papers in, uh, there's another paper in, uh, in ESR, I don't remember exactly, but they have, uh, they, they also believe that this, um, this uh, result signature is, should be from the transition zone depths. And also um, the paper, in Nanjing University. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean here, they, they are not direct evidence, but this should be some uh, signature. Signature is likely uh, from the transition zone depths. Yeah, I'm not an expert in this part, but yeah, I, I probably only can, can read the conclusions like that. Okay, thank you. Hi, 
Hello, Jianfeng. Hey, hello. Uh, very nice to hear you talk today. Uh, I have two more questions. One question is, in your model, I, it, it looks there is no melting in low velocity zone number three, right? And there is no melting. Right, if you compare figure A on the left and figure B on the right, there is no melting um, like seismic tomography beneath town by sun as in your models. Is that I understand correctly? Or an another question is, is sticky air important in your model? Like can your model produce similar results without sticky air? <laughs> sticky air is really difficult to simulate. Can you make your model yeah. simpler? Uh, okay. okay, first I answer, uh, that's, uh, that's true that you observe that the, the partial molten rock, uh, rocks or partial molten regions is not uh, uh, just above the slab. Uh, but we do see this, uh, this model if we set uh, 0.28%, then it's likely that the partial motion just above the slab. And to explain this term by this, this could be uh, well compare, comparable to the term by volcano. Yeah, what, what do you think about uh, this explanation? But in this model, you, you don't have the other melting further away from the slab though, right? Uh, I, I don't get what. Yeah. Uh, melting you well. You mean here, this region? Yes, I, I mean. Yeah, yeah. As I said, here, here we ha we got the we got the partial melting, uh, in front of the slab, but not uh, exactly above the slab. Oh, right. But yeah, that's true. But if we lower down this uh, what content. It is likely that the the partial molten rock, uh, to occur above the slab. So, right. I mean, yeah, actually, I also talk lots of uh, parameters, and it's not easy to to change the dynamics because it's too complicated, especially about this mass extraction process. It would it would likely change the the dynamics if you see okay. 0.2 and 0.3, they have uh, looks like different uh, features. But but we still argue that it is like here the model because the transition zone has real homogeneous uh, uh, distributed uh, water. So actually, they should be somehow maybe only like this some uh, wet pockets, and also if you have this homogeneous distributed water, there will be too much mud extraction and too much volcanics. So if not, then it's, now we only have this uh, Chang Bai volcano. It's not that, that much. So it's likely it, uh, the water in the transition zone is likely to be uh, heterogeneous distributed. Okay, so if you go to the geological map, yeah, so why there is a gap of melting in the basin? There is no melting in the basin, like Tang Bai San, then go to the further west, is in Mongolia and outside mm -hmm. of the North China at at the boundary, and there is no melting in the basin, right? Yeah, yeah, um, I did notice that. That uh, looks like a good point. Uh, I have to read the paper by you know, um, Niu Yao uh, Lin. had a George paper, a George paper uh, this year or last, last year. They, they thought that uh, the, the magmatism is likely related to the Lisa's phallic thickness. Then I also asked some uh, geochemists and they, they don't agree it at all. <laughs> so 
uh, this is this would be uh, really this would be a different uh, topic. I could not say that all this organism is related to the uh, transition zone process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this could be likely some other process. I it's difficult to say. Okay, I see. I, I previously thought your model can explain this gap because uh, this volcano and the volcano and there is a gap. Like in your last figure, they show the gap, but this gap is not that gap, right? No. Like in no. your last figure in your paper, there is a gap. No, no, that, 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 that's different. That's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, this, uh, yeah, we, we explained that that's why this, uh, what can you gap? Because some there's no water transported to the mental depths, because the boy and the superior man uh, uh, mental. So there's no water can be transported to the mental. So there's no partial melting. Then there's no volcanics. Yeah, there's still be a different different one. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Ming Ming's question also contains that about the sticky air. So in the beginning of your model, that they put some let's say very um, uh, low viscous uh, components that are near the subduction zone at the, your initial conditions, which maybe cause that is a sticky air. I'm not a geodynamist, I don't know how to call it, but I could understand that it will. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, 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 could you explain more about that technical details? Okay, okay. Um, okay. Here, this part is actually the sticky air because this code used the find uh, difference. Find difference is not like fine element. Fine element, the grid can be deformed, but fine difference, you have, uh, here we don't have this adaptive uh, mesh or anything. The mesh is, is constrained in the, at the beginning. So it's always a uh, rectangle. So it's not possible to simulate the, uh, the real topography. Then how to simulate the topography? Then uh, in the foreign difference methods, we usually use uh, sticky air. Because uh, uh, first, uh, the, the sticky means the viscosity is high because it's much higher than the real air. We use, uh, for example, here we use 10 to 18 Pascal seconds for the, for the air. But in realistic, it, this is maybe uh, one Pascal. So which is much larger than uh, the, the realistic one. So we call it the sticky. But it's still valid. That's because uh, in our numerical model, we, we have some uh, cutoff. The cutoff is quite necessary in uh, two aspects for them. The first, the computer has some limitation of uh, storing the, uh, the data. If your data is too large, is, there will be some, uh, some error. Then uh, the second for the stabilization, if your viscosity drop is too large, then the numerical models, the, the metrics will be quite uh, singular. So it's not easy to solve the the equation. So we use a uh, really, uh, really high or cutoff, reach the cutoff viscosity. But why is still valid? That's because even though you have uh, the viscosity is high, but the, the stress is very really low. So uh, the, the air will not uh, prevent the, the evolution of the log. So in this way, I mean, because the stress, the resistance stress of the air is very really low. So it will not uh, resist the, the rock deformation. So the lo if the rock goes up, it goes up. So this could uh, create the topography. For the sticky air, we, we want to simulate the topography. Yeah. Can you, uh, can the model produce melting as well without sticky air? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. The sticky air is only for the, to simulate the topography. If you use, simply use this, uh, 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 the model with all sticky air, it is possible. But there's one problem is that the subduction is, is not that easy 
because the sticky, if you have a free surface, this is actually simulate the mimic the free surface. If you have the stick air, then the slab is easy to, uh, to rebound, it's more easier to subduct. Uh, if you don't have the stick air, then uh, I probably need a larger slab deep, but it will not influence the, um, I mean, not, not much. I think I didn't try, but I think it will not influence much of the dynamics. Okay, I think so. Okay, uh, I have a following question for the sub data slab actually. So if you change your sub dotting angle, what would you expect the consequences will be? Um, here actually, yeah, I don't change the, the angle uh, because uh, this is the initial setup. Um, um, we only assign a slab tip and it later is fully dynamic. But for example, if I use a very large angle at the beginning, then, then I think the system will not, uh, will not stable because the angle is too large, then it's, it simply thinks. The slab thinks and you, you generate a large gap around here, then there'll be too much uh, partial molten around this region. So the system will not be stable. But um, uh, I do I don't know this um, this this because this is fully dynamic. It's difficult to say. <laughs> yeah. And actually, yeah. Of course, if you say where it influenced the uh, the water budget, then we have another walk. Um, yeah, no, this would be another walk. But it will, um, it has very small influence actually, for example. Yeah, here we investigate different uh, thermal parameter for the water budget. So we found that the slab deep, this is a kinematic, kinematic model, not, not like the mo dynamic model before. The kinematic, uh, kinematic model show that the subjective angle will not influence much about the world budget at least. But yeah, it's, it's not easy to say where it influenced the, the dynamics or not. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Envo, for sharing your work. And uh, it's a very uh, worthwhile and a fruitful discussion for us to understand the dynamics of a volatile, in particular, hydrogen in the Earth's solid Earth interior. Okay, thank you very much for sharing. And thanks, everybody, for participating in our seminar today. So have a good night. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, thank thanks, you. Thanks, 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 Jianfeng. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> ciao, ciao.